Hi, this is Steve. This is Bob. This is Jay. And we are Alpha Quadrant 6. We are a science fiction review show. And on this episode, we are reviewing the Orville. Finally. Finally. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> now, this is 100% the result of our viewers asking for us to do it. We're happy to do it. It took us a little while because Bob and I had a lot of catching up to do. Right. Yes. So this is Seth MacFarlane's project. This is he's apparently a huge Star Trek fan, and the Orville is like his homage to Star Trek. And that's what I love about it. He's not making fun of it. It's not like really a parody. Right. He this he loves. It's this. not Galaxy Quest. No, it's not. It's not. Although okay, it gets compared a lot to Galaxy it, Quest. It does, and because of the humor. Of course, right. there's definitely a thread of humor running through this, which is kind of waxed and waned a little, mm, oh a little yeah. bit. And humor is very very hard to do in in sci-fi. Think think about really good science fiction and humor. Uh, Hitchhiker's Guide, of course, yeah. is like the iconic apotheosis of that. Yeah. But but Galaxy Quest, fantastic. But yep. there's not you know, there's a few things here and yeah, there yeah. are very hard to do. But this this kind of succeeds in in I, I love the humor and sometimes I'm yeah. like putting my hand over my mouth because like you don't expect to see such adult comments on sci any science fiction. Right. Yeah. So speaking of unexpected, I mean I think that's what Seth MacFarlane is going for. So just you know to overview everything, this is a future. Uh, like 200 years in the future, uh, Earth future. It's very much like Star Trek, the aesthetic, the look and the feel. Next and generation specifically, specifically, right? Specifically. You have a nice sleek ship that, you know, the technology is very similar. The A lot of the episodes are very reminiscent of Star yeah. Trek episodes. But, you know, McFarlane made some interesting choices with this series. So the subject matter is very serious, just like Star Trek. Uh, but the characters are generally not very serious. They're, they're comedic, although they can get dramatic and serious. Mm. And their humor is fully contemporary. It's, uh, like they make it's it, modern day humor. It's modern day. All the cultural references are <clears throat> modern day, all the idioms and everything. So they make no attempt to sound like they're from 200 years or 300 years right. in the future. Right. I'm okay We're, with that. I mean, uh, Star Trek does a good job of their techno babble, typically. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, they're not like making jokes about what was on TV, our modern TV yeah. last week. But that is, if you think about it, that's that's Seth's shtick. Yes. Right? I mean he his jokes a hundred percent, if you look at all the stuff that you know, if you look at Family Guy as a as a perfect example, he is he is parroting mm -hmm. pop culture. So yeah, why sure. why wouldn't he do that with his show? It, yeah. it works. I mean it's funny. It does seem a little out of place, but you gotta get you have to get over the idea that this isn't Star Trek. Right, right. So right. It, it, there's a lot of eye candy on there that that makes you feel like it's Star Trek, especially like the color of the uniforms, mm -hmm. the look of the uniforms. Um, I, I, that's all fine. I, I mean, I don't I don't have a problem with it. What happened is it took me till about halfway through season one before I realized emotionally that I had to stop thinking of comparing it to Star it's Trek hard. all the time. It's hard, but you do get there. It has to become its own thing, and it, and that was that was there like just like any Star Trek show that we've watched that we that we love now like even next gen you know first season kind of sucked they had a pretty good first season mm -hmm. I, it was a very well realized you know show that they came up with that like the characters were very fully realized right. um and in in some ways it it does better than even like discovery right like let me give let me compare apples to apples real quick like i know the bridge crew better strangely on yeah, uh, right. On, we're on on a, we're, we are on a first right. name basis with the bridge crew, right. and That's Discovery right. hasn't really quite gotten us there. Yeah, um, but why is that? Because they're giving that they're giving them attention. You know, they have, they're getting more attention. Yeah. They have more personality, and it's talking. Like you know, you don't hear, you really don't hear the people on the bridge talking to each other that much. It happens, you know, but it's mostly happening with a primary, not you know, mm. a secondary will talk to a primary, right? But on his show, like the two guys that are in front, the the, the, the pilot and Lamar the, and Gordon, right? Th those two characters have a funny relationship they with do. each other. We, you know, like every character has a relationship with every other right. character. That's what you need, and, yeah. that, and, he's, and right. he did it. And that's smart. Yeah. He Gordon also he also didn't up. overfill the bridge. That, yeah. That's another important thing. You know, you want to have it be just enough people. Like you know, on, on the original series Enterprise, you always got it the was sense an intimate crew. But yeah. there was one person on there that you didn't know. Mm -hmm. Always. One, pretty yeah, much one or always. two, yep. And that's kind of cool because they swap them out. You never need to get to know them because you don't see them enough. On, on Seth, Seth MacFarlane's bridge, you, you know every face, everybody talks, everybody mm -hmm. has a relationship with each other. So I like that. It works. It totally mm -hmm. sells the characters. Yeah, it, it, at first, we're, so we're at the end of the second season when we're reviewing it. We're reviewing the first two seasons. 
it took me a while too to like try to figure out what is the show trying to be. Is it trying to be funny? Is it trying to be dramatic? Is it trying to explore good science fiction themes? Like it's bouncing around and doing all of those things. And I think for that reason, the critics generally hate it, mm -hmm. but the audience generally loves it. Like yeah. right. it's if weird, you, but it sort of weirdly if works. You, if you just sort of let it be what it is and not worry about thinking about what it's trying to be and just sort of exactly. enjoy it for what it is. Exactly, and that's hard for people to do. If you look at Rotten Tomatoes, you'll see like the critics rated 30% yeah. and the and the uh, the fans like 80%. Yeah. And that just shows you the critics are just way, way off base on this one. They just, they just don't understand it. Because it's unconventional. Right, oh, it's unconventional, but, oh my God. Ah, but it works. That's typical with Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. I mean, we see this all the time. Um, we were just talking about yeah. how, you know, even with Captain Marvel. Although it was kind of flipped. It was flipped. It was, yeah. it was odd. But, you know, you're going to see you're going to see the critics, like, having very different opinions, good or bad, with the general audience. So let's talk about just broad brushstrokes. We don't want to do any spoilers in this review. So just broad brushstrokes. What, what's been good, not so good, you know, mediocre about this series. So one of my complaints in the first season was that I thought the writing was extremely predictable. It was. Like, first five minutes of the show, I was like, oh, this, this, this is what's going to happen. This you, is you, that episode. This is that episode. There, This is going to happen. I mean, you basically just, I plotted out the whole episode in my head in two seconds. So it was so derivative of Star Trek that it, would, it would lost the ability to, like, take me on a journey because I was already at the finish line at the first five right. minutes so of the show. So right. what you're saying is you're Star Trek foo. Yeah. Was so powerful that you you can predict the. But early that's writing. the audience. That's the yeah. that's the target audience for this show. Yeah, I mean we do like we've joked about this before, but between the three of us, we have you know almost 150 years of watching <laughs> yeah. Star Trek. But so, the second season was has been better. Yeah, yeah, it's stronger. I mean, you get it's stronger. This, you could feel that the team took a break. The mm -hmm. writers went on vacation. You know, whatever it is, like the things cooked and gestated, and then the second season comes back. Where it would be, it would have been great if the second season was the first season in a weird sense. Like give them yeah. all that time to cook and come back and then. You know. I see what you're saying, but the, yeah. So the second, but they, we got through the first season. It was entertaining. It was funny. The second season's better. You got to leave yourself some place to go. That's sure. great. So the writing was better. I mean, there were still some clunky episodes in season two. There's what I call the love boat episode, which was so <laughs> thin. That yeah, was terrible. It was so thin. It was like uh, the B plot was the A the plot. B, oh, the B the B plot was a nothing. <laughs> the, the A plot was a B plot, and the B plot like was non-existent. Okay. But, uh, you'll know what you'll know the episode when we get there. The Love Boat episode, but um, you know, but some of the episodes were great, like really intense subject matter. Like, you know, again, Star Trek-esque, but mm -hmm. even more nuanced and deeper than an average yeah. uh, next-gen episode. And they did it, they dealt with those issues very well. Like, how do different cultures with very different values make it work? I thought that was so you know? cool. As a very early concept in season one, mm -hmm. they come out with an episode talking about, like, alien races cannot judge other alien races on their cultural differences. Right. And... They were judging each other, yes. and in, and then certain characters changed their mind. Like, and it wasn't odd; it was just unexpected. And then it really gives you a, a hard look. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I'm sitting there like, "What's the, you know, what's the the modern day tie-in? Like, what are they actually talking about here?" But I just like I like it. You know, science fiction is supposed to do this, yeah. by the way. It's supposed to make you think about the world that you currently live in. Well, you know, while exactly, you, exactly. You know, we can get mm -hmm. Star Trek: The Original Series and the Next Gen like knock that out of the park. Yeah, like like the race with a. White on on one side and black on the other side and the other one. It was a little, little it's a, obvious. It looked a little yeah. in your face, yeah. but it was still you know directly yeah, comment, commenting on. It's it. funny that cultural cultural society. Society. science fiction, at some point in the, the history of humanity, picked up the banner of we're going to break convention with science fiction. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying other shows don't do it. All in the Family was one of those shows that you know went against the norms. You know mm -hmm. they had a toilet flushing on there, which was you know we can't even fathom why that's a big deal. They had inter <laughs> in time. some interracial stuff going on. You know this, all of these things dealing with homosexuality and everything that was huge back then. Today, I mean, it's, you know, it's sad to say you know we still kind of need some of that mm -hmm. going on today or a lot of that going on today. But science fiction has historically been the vehicle that we yeah. it, we analyze ourselves through. Well, it's, I, a, I think. it's a great vehicle because you can take you out of yourself, out of your culture, get a view from on high, you get another culture's view of you or your view of another culture, yeah. and you can play with those variables, like with the Mocklins, like the Mocklins are an all-male, essentially homosexual species that um, uh, is anti-female. Is anti-female yeah. and... Um, stigmatizes heterosexual love, you right. know, so it just sort of flips the script cool. for this yeah. culture. And then they, and this has come up more, in more than one episode, you know, it has been a, a, a huge driving the plot in a very interesting way. 
and how everyone else reacts to it, you know? And yeah, but also um, with science fiction and, 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 and fantasy as well, it also lets you avoid like censorship because mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not hitting you over the face with, with this little uh, morality tale. Yeah. And uh, so it, it kind of slips by. It does, it slips it's, by. Right, I think you're right. By. I think that's, yeah. a, you guys hit the nail on the head. That's how You can have yeah. an interspecies relationship and explore all of that. It's really talking about race, but it's not because it's about different species that don't really exist. So it don't, there's no right. taboo yeah. about it because you know, it's right. fantasy. Right, and then yeah. you could enjoy it as a kid. Like we were when we were watching Trek, classic Trek, we were clueless, really. We were we were that young. <laughs> then you watch it later on, you know, ten years later, you're like, damn, I see what they're getting at here. It's yeah, like you, like yeah, multiple yeah. levels, right. which is a really great way to enjoy like watching shows like SpongeBob with our kids. They're laughing their asses off, and we're laughing too, thinking, at oh a deeper boy, level, yeah, yeah, at a much deeper level. And that's, that's great when that happens. So let's let's shift a little bit to the aesthetic of the show. So again, the aesthetic okay. is very much Star Trek, and I like the clean style, the you know the Bright primary color. Definitely colors. not gritty. But and dark. not gritty. No, no. It's very antiseptic. But I have to say, I just I think that's the weakest part of the show. Yeah. I don't like it. So you have like the ship is like, you know, is the, the, the main thing. From the outside, the Orville, the ship, and which is basically the same design of the whole fleet. Mm -hmm. I just don't like it. I'm trying to like yeah, it, it from certain angles. I'm like, okay, it kind of looks neat, but when, but in general, when you get that full side view of the ship, it just but looks silly. Everything kind of comes off that way. I though. can't get over it though. It, yeah. you know, it, it does. Yeah. It, it, it does. I'm like, oh, I just wish that ship looked a little cooler, you know. And I wish it, the uniforms were just a little bit better. And I wish just everything. The shuttlecraft too is a big the shuttlecraft. Very is, disappointing. Yeah, shuttlecraft so what is, is that? Okay. Is that budget? Like I don't understand. It's just the quality of the art design, the set design. You know, this is why people win Academy Awards when they do a good job for it. This is just not as good. And it does make me appreciate how incredibly yes. good Star Trek: The Original Series was. You think about the Enterprise. For that time, designing a ship that is still beautiful and then spawned an entire genre, if you will, of, of you know, variations on that yeah, theme of think ship. Yeah, think about it. You, Some of the most beautiful ships are in absolutely. that Absolutely. you got a primary hull, two nacelles, and a, uh, and a secondary hull. That's yeah. pretty much it. That, within that kind of uh, design space, Look, Google it. Google it right now. Just look up Federation yeah. Starship. You will find a thousand different variations on that, <laughs> right. and some of them are to this day they're gorgeous. I want to see them on the series. The they're Orville's so not going to have that. No, not going to have it. I mean, it, not it's, a, have it. it's a it's a huge thing to compare anything to Star Trek, especially the original series. And I'll tell you know, think about what you're saying here. Like they knocked the ball so far out of the yeah. park. Matt Jeffries, like, Matt Jeffries. Yeah, it was like the first three <laughs> Star Wars movies. Like they're they're yes. It's it's very hard to. Say, like, can you one-up the amazing sound effects and special effects of the time? You know, you can't. Like, there are, these are iconic brands that you can't, you can't compare right. things to. And that's part of the problem. And, and this is, you know, one thing I want to talk about with the Orville. Part of the problem is that it's, it is derivative of Star Trek enough. And I want to say so derivative because it is so derivative, but I don't want to make yeah. that sound negative. But because it's derivative of Star Trek, it makes you... Constantly compare it. That's why I said it took me mm. half a season before I just got over it. It took a lot of yeah. viewing. But even if you're not making that comparison, it's just not a pretty ship. Yeah, you're right. It, but it, it just doesn't do it for you. They needed me. a few more design meetings. Yeah, exactly. They, they needed to up their design game. That's the bottom line. And I think that the. It would. It actually what does affect the enjoyment of the show. It does. I think it, it, it does because you're so used to seeing amazing ships and really just loving it so much. Yeah, it doesn't stay is, up with the crowd. It's not. It's not like there's like a problem with the Orville. I don't like the design of any ship on that series. No, it's just not. Right? It's it's just, just, there isn't a single ship where I'm like, oh, that's pretty. All right. So I have, have a suspicion. Yeah. I have a suspicion. Yeah. I, I bet you that that Seth had his hands in in it so much, and you know this might be show. I don't know. I'm guessing, but it does make sense. Yeah. He might have like been, he might have made a lot of de decisions about the art design and all that stuff, and he's just not sure. qualified to do that. I know that if I were him and I was making a show, I would be like calling a lot of shots that I probably shouldn't call. Think about <laughs> I guess it, you would, right? Jay. No, but no, think but about you gotta it. know how to work with the creative people. Exactly. Like, you know. Right. So call call some people from Babylon Five. To, yeah. to design your ships. Right, yeah, like right, Babylon right. 5. That's a TV oh series. I mean, and, From the 90s. From the 90s, and the ships are gorgeous. I watched, that, I watched the whole thing, Super Nuts, again, just a few years ago, and I was thinking, man, the CG ships aren't going right, to... Oh, how do they age? Uh, they were still be, fantastic. Be fair, though, guys. Be fair. Because, yeah, the digital ships in Babylon 5 were unique, inventive, cool. Gorgeous. The Vorlon but, ship and but the Shadow almost ship. almost 
every other decision they made on that show was terrible. <laughs> what are you talking uh, about? The interior of the uh, the interior of Babylon Five, the the the, the mm -hmm. sets were terrible. The costuming was horrible. The 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 makeup and everything was I just. Do, I the disagree. Line. You're be, you're being way this too critical. This is a different review. Dude. We'll we'll do Babylon way Five. Way too critical. Yeah, we can't Babylon Five at a different time. Right, look, man, we Epic can't help but have it bleed in. But we're we're comparing these. You know, we are comparing these. But we were talking about the ships. Okay, let's but, get back to the ships. Uh, but anyway, let's move on. So what else do we need to talk about? So I think the the plot could be better, but it's, it is getting better in season two. The the design needs to be better. The the characters are good. I like all the characters. They're interesting. They they're, they're uh, they have depth. They have good relationships. I like the I like the mature some of the mature things that happen. Yeah. Because just again, I'm not used to seeing them. For example, uh, Primal Lurch's episode. Um, Bordis. Uh, is basically having an affair on the in the hollow suite. I mean, it's not an affair, but he's going <laughs> no, he's on a, there, and he's the guy's getting down with, that, many, with lots of guys. Hollow deck porn addiction. Yes, which every character in this universe would have. Of yes, course. And, I mean, think uh, about it. You, totally, have a, you have a hollow deck that where you could do anything guys, you want. Guys, I'm waiting for it. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I'm, 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 when I get a hollow deck and a replicator, you're never going to see me again. Where did Bob go? Um, but they hinted at it. They hinted at it in Next Gen. They, they just did yeah. a couple words here and there. Yeah, like Star Trek. Riker's like, I'm going to see you in the holodeck. Yeah. Um, right. No, they can't the go holodeck. there, though. They couldn't they go couldn't. there this, this is what would happen. And it was really like, it just, just struck me as so awesome. And not only that, you're also hitting the themes of you know heterosexuality and homosexuality as well, which is great, right, even though does, it's an alien. That does bring up a point in that... <laughs> Because the the characters are contemporary yeah. and they are and they're humorous, they're actually more realistic yes, in a way, yes. right? Because they're not trying to be lofty. They're so human, and I think that's the strength of the humor yeah. and the characters and the writing. Yeah. So that the, all of the characters are so mundanely human, but that makes them so relatable and funny because they could do silly, goofy stuff like we all do. I know. You know? I, all right, but you but the line that that's being drawn here is with Starfleet. These people are the cream of yeah. the cream of the crop, right? You know, not just anyone can get on the bridge of a ship in Starfleet. That's right. like, you know, that's like becoming a, a boy band. Like, there's only a certain number of people yeah. a year that are ever going to get there. But the Orville is a loser. It second is though. That's ship. what I was going to say. Is. So it does make sense. Some people in the Orville in the Orville universe are Star Trek yes. guys at that level. Right. It's just, this this is, ship is, yeah, the is heat, at the bottom of the heat. I love it. The, the first episode, the Admiral. These are the losers of the Union. He goes, yeah. look, the fact of the matter is is that we've got so many of these ships that we just got to pull you in as a I mean, he told them, <laughs> yeah, we've yeah, got yeah. so many of these ships. We've got 20,000 of these <laughs> ships that, you know, a loser like you is going to end up being the captain. Okay. Wow. Right. But it, but it is it, the loser crew. But it's smart. It is it great. It was a great choice. These are like the, they're, they're the, the bad news bears of, <laughs> of science fiction. <laughs> right. right? They are. And it's, yes. it's genius. It is actually pretty damn smart yeah, because I agree. he wasn't setting himself up to fail by by uh, we're gonna go full Star Trek. Yeah, no, they're not lofty. No. Yeah, exactly. They had to they had to make it so they were the underdog semi loser crew. I mean, he's got his ex wife on the ship with him. Right. That's screwed up. Like I, I actually said to myself when that First hit my brain. I'm like, it's it's smart writing, but it's dangerous. You know, like mm. what's going to happen between? I was looking forward to finding yeah. out what was going to happen between those those two. I was actually surprised to see how fast they became friends with each other, even mm. though there's still tension. But there's still, I mean, the relationship evolves throughout the entire two seasons. Yeah, it does continue it's, to go, though, and it's and, and it's important. plausibly. It's not like they're stretching it out or anything. And you so know how you hate when they had take they take like the. Uh, the, the the romantic interest and yeah. they they to try to stretch out the tension as long yeah. as possible. Like I think the first episode, the first series that I remember where they really did that was Moonlighting. You remember Moonlighting? Yeah, yeah. With Bruce Willis. Yeah, yeah. That was like the core of that episode. Was the sexual that, tension? Was right? the sexual? Like, but they they, then, they stretched the sexual tension out forever. Yeah, but Steve, don't you remember what happened? They consummated, and then it got boring. I know. That's so, right. That was the point. They set right. themselves up. But I think they're doing a good job. <laughs> okay, yeah. Normal in that the sexual tension is is more complicated, yeah. and it's not just this one note that is they're trying to sustain. Okay, yeah, yeah, I got you. Yeah. And so therefore, yeah. it, it, they leave, they left themselves some places yeah. to go. I mean, it happened on the office between Jim and. Pam too. Like yeah. it was really fun to watch them fall in love with each other. But when they when they finally got together, it did take a dip. Like the intensity of their plot. Mm -hmm. you, um, well, remember when Kelly w was dating that guy? Yeah. And and, and uh, she's in her room with him. And Seth takes a shuttle <laughs> and does a drive by by her window when he's looking from in. The outside, that yeah. was just like, dude, you, you have major problems. You're the commander <laughs> of this ship. What? Do you... yeah, but that was also super fun. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm laughing about it. Right. Yeah. Right. right. 
And then end of season two, I don't want to give the spoiler away, but it, away. it does get very serious. The last two episodes, which I thought were the best of the, if, you know, if you if you feel yeah. like the second season's dragging a little bit, just stick it out because it, you know it's it's worth the setup. And some of them are they are just setting up this sort of climax in the yeah. last two episodes of the second season, and it's it's great. It, that is yeah. like Star Trek worthy, you know, good hardcore science fiction. Um, what do you think about any more details? But I liked it. What do you think about like the idea that they're not trying to save the universe every episode? There isn't a lot of that going on. Yeah, it's a little bit of it at the end. No, I, but yeah, I, but I agree. It's not, it's not happening three are, or four times. The stakes are personal. Yeah, 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 it's much more down to the. Yeah, right. I, I get that, but it's okay for a TV show to pull that card. I think once, once. every couple of seasons. Yeah, but you right. can't. You know, it, it gets to the point now with a lot yeah. of, especially with science fiction. A lot of times, it's like the stakes are so epically high. I mean, in all the movies we see with all the explosions and all everything, right. it's like the stakes go so high. You know, I really enjoy, there was a whole batch of movies that came out this year. And it's like, you know, I'm veering off of, of science fiction a little bit. But I enjoy stories that get personal, that are about this little moment in time. It doesn't necessarily have to be like the big thing yeah. that, that yeah. is yeah. all-encompassing. And to write good science fiction that doesn't have that, it's, why is it so hard? I don't know why they always go to the, like, let's make it where, like, if they don't do this, the reality is going to undo. Yeah, yeah. Blows I up. hate that. So you know they can't fail, you know. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> No, I agree. I think that's one of my criticisms. I think just because it's this competition, we have to go bigger, bigger, you know, bigger explosions, bigger stakes. Everything's got to be higher. Yeah. Uh, but it's no, you actually you don't. You, you don't need to be saving the universe every time. Right. right? Having very personal stakes still works. You know. Yeah. And right. you've got to leave yourself someplace to go every now and then. You can't yeah. always be... Right, or you could do like Rick and Morty and like, oh boy, we screwed up this time. Let's go to another, another go to parallel another universe, universe yeah. and, and start all over again. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, well that's so there's no stakes in Rick and Morty. <laughs> right? That's kind of the point. I yeah. think Seth McFarlane carved out, I think, kind of a new niche he here. Did. He, he did. This is a, this I is think a, very deliberately, yeah. And I, and I respect him more now than I did when the, the series started. Because in the beginning, you know, you don't, you don't see their vision. You don't know yeah. what... what the big brushstroke was that they were trying to get to. But now that I'm kind of getting it, you know, I'm hoping that they get a few more seasons. It would be fun yeah. if they can keep going. So I think overall, I'm enjoying watching yeah. it. I think it's fun. There, again, there are some problems with the quality that I think are, some are getting better, some are kind of baked in, like, again, the aesthetics of the ship. Um, but there's not a deal, nothing is a deal killer. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing the, the series evolve further because I do think it is evolving. Right. And in a, in a good direction. And it is a new experience, and it's, it's hard to find that. Just got to give it to McFarlane for, for doing that, for giving sure. us a unique science fiction, you know, watching experience. Yeah. It's not real. I mean, even though it, as derivative as it is aesthetically, it really is its own thing in terms of... Now it is, it, for it really sure. Is, right. Yeah. And maybe if we get lucky, at some point in the near future, they'll upgrade them one level higher ship, and they'll have a different yeah, ship that, right. that, that yeah, I was just really thinking like. about that. Like, that's the way that they could redo yeah. all the... They need to hire a new set designer, yeah. a new... Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of art money, though. Art it's, it's hard to rip down a set that you've already built that works. Yeah. It does the well, job. Yeah, that's but true. but it would be cheap to just make minor modifications and then redo the entire ship because that's all digital anyway. Yeah, the right? outside. Yeah, do the yeah. Un redo the, the outside at least if you can. You know, yeah. I was thinking when we saw the Enterprise at the Air and Space Museum in DC, the original mm -hmm. Enterprise that they built. Enterprise. Um, there is something about oh. about them having experience. a model. Like I get that it's so much easier to do it digital. Yeah. I get it, but I think that we should we should have something in science fiction where we say if there's ever like the ship in the show, like in um, like uh, the Expanse as an example. Yeah. There's a couple of major ships that that you keep you know mm -hmm. that you keep visiting or the crew yeah. is on or whatever. They should make it where they have to build the model. <laughs> well, think about it though. Think about it. I know you're laughing, but. Yeah. Who's the, they in that statement? Us, the science fiction community. We should demand that they demand build models they build of these the model. things because they need to end up in museums and let people come see them and have it be a part of the culture. You know, like yeah. I, I, first off, models. Are, I, I appreciate models. When you mm -hmm. go and stand in front of a model, you know, we we stood in front of the moon lander. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like being physically in front of an object is so different. And there is something that bothers me about thinking that these things don't actually exist. I like knowing there's an Enterprise out there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I like knowing that Han Solo's original blaster is out there. Mm -hmm. I can't have it, and I mm -hmm. want it, but I like knowing it's <laughs> right. there. So right. 
Maybe they did a prototype. I of, hope they uh, did. Of, some, mm -hmm. of, of like the expand ships. I wouldn't be surprised if they had a, like a 3D prototype so that you could just look at it from any angle you want. I know you could do it that digitally, but maybe they did do that. It's so it's so cheap these days to, to print out something like that. But yeah, a big a big super detailed model. Yeah, that's not that's not cheap. But I agree. Yeah. I, I like having that tactile. Yeah, we're humans, 3D man. We're we, we're meat space. Existence. Yeah. And even still, sometimes with uh, real models, uh, with practical effects, they look better. Even as good as CG oh, yeah. is getting. Yeah. People are realizing now that you can't just go all CG because, mm. because practical You never go effects, all CG, man. You, right, you can't. You <laughs> Take a full, full CG. CG. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, we, we now, we, I think it's really more greatly appreciated now that you need to have a certain amount of practical effects. Yeah. Right. And because people were thinking, oh boy, your career as a modeler is going gonna to be disappear because it's all going digital. And we're learning, no, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because Talk you, to the boys at Weta. It, right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, yes. I think we overall recommend absolutely. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And hopefully we'll be back to review season 3 when that's out. Yeah.